fifth generation wireless communication systems today. Uh, my name is Bala Natarajan. I'm a professor at Kansas State University. Uh, been there over 12 years uh, working uh, on a lot of different problems related to wireless communication systems as well as sensor networks and uh, cyber physical systems. Um, so today we're going to focus on, uh, as I said, fifth generation wireless systems and specifically talk about some enabling technologies. Now, a good place to start would be to kind of reflect on where we came from and where we are going before we, we talk about where we are going. So if you look at the evolution of wireless systems, uh, it started back in the 80s with the first generation system, which was primarily analog. Uh, and the focus there was really to get something to work. That was really the purpose, uh, kind of the driving force of, uh, of the first generation system was, I want to build something that works. Okay? Uh, and voice was the primary service that people were concerned about. Um, then in the 90s, so that was the 80s, in the 90s, we moved on to the second generation system, what we call as 2G systems. And there, uh, with, with 2G systems is when the market penetration started to increase. More people started having phones. And while voice was still the major, uh, major factor, uh, there were starting, people were starting to use uh, messaging. So data services were, 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 were kind of emerging. So then in the 2000s, we moved to what, what is called as 3G systems. Okay? So in the third generation systems, uh, the, the data rate started to increase. Uh, more users, certain new services started to come up. And of course, in 2G, we moved to digital, so that kind of helped the whole process. Now, in 2010, so every 10 years now, that, so in this, in this decade, we're talking about 4G systems. Okay? And, and the key idea here is, of course, even higher data rates and uh, broadband mobile wireless access and a lot of new services associated with that. And to some level, integration of different other wireless technologies. So if you, if you look at kind of where we came from in around 2000s, a lot of Wi-Fi and other, other, other wireless services became popular. And 4G, in a way, is trying to in, in, uh, integrate some of those things. You can already make calls over Wi-Fi right, in many of the phones. Uh, so that's kind of where we came from. Uh, and so the question that, is, that we should ask here is that every 10 years, it seems like we have moved to a to different generation of wireless systems. So 2020 would be the next obvious uh, next step. And people are already talking about 5G wireless. Okay? I know in India, I think for, uh, we are, you're still pri primarily using 3G technologies. But I'm assuming 4G is going to be rolled in pretty soon here. Uh, but 2020 is when people are thinking that 5G technologies are going to come into play. Uh, now, the standardization efforts for 5G wireless has, uh, you know, is going to start most likely next year. So from what that means is, currently no one really knows what it's going to be go going to look like. But a lot of people have a vision of what it might look like. And today I'm going to share what that vision is going to be and focus on specific technologies that is going to make this 5G wireless vision a reality. So I'm going to start off with a kind of a positive note. First tell you all that you are all very special people. Uh, in academics, we are all special people. Why are we special? Because our job as an academic, as a researcher, graduate student, as a professor, our job is to always look ahead. Look ahead to the future and try to fi figure out how we can make this future a better place. That's the same for wireless, for any other uh, research area. Okay? And in that process, we are, we are, in a sense, trying to solve problems that are not problems that exist today. Okay? We are trying to solve problems that, may, that we have to face down the road. Right? So the key aspect of research, and I want you to all take this, to, uh, take this seriously, is uh, good research problems are problems that will be relevant by the time you graduate, not when you started. 
Okay? So you want to pick problems and work on good, good problems that will be relevant down the road. And so we are at this, at, at this state where I said every 10 years things are changing. So now we should be looking at what are the challenges associated with 5G. Well, what is 5G? What are the challenges that, might, that it might present? And then start finding ways to address some of those challenges. Okay, that, is, that would be a really tangible way to contribute uh, to, this, uh, to this domain. So are we just impatient? Are we just bored? Is that why every 10 years we are going to try to come up with a new thing? Uh, well, it's not really the case that we are bored. Uh, we have to prepare ourselves for the future, right? So um, here is what is happening uh, as far as our, uh, our use of wireless, uh, wireless services and, and, and data. The number of mobile connections from 2013 to 2018 has gone up by 3.5 billion, approximately 3.2 billion. Uh, the amount of mobile data traffic has gone up, is, is expected to go up uh, to 15.9 exabytes. Now what is an exabyte? You know what a gigabyte is? What is an exabyte? It's 10 to the 18th, right? So 10 to the 18th uh, bytes. Uh, so that's, that's going to go up. Why is it going to go up? You can see those pictures telling you what are the services that's driving up these, uh, these uh, mobile data traffic. Um, there is also, again, everything is being stored in the cloud. There's going to be significant cloud traffic, 70% uh, increase by 2020. And uh, you're going to have a lot of connected devices. This is going to be a, something that is extremely revolutionary revolutionary from a wireless system standpoint you're going to have vehicles that could have wireless connectivity you have different physical devices that you should be able to talk to um, and so these are things that are happening it's already happening right 2010 you had 12.5 uh, billion devices now we're talking about 50 billion devices so these are changes that are happening you like it or not okay and the question is are we going to be a step up, uh, you know, take a step and plan for, be, uh, for, for this change? Or are you going to stick to an old technology and just let, let it saturate? Okay? Obviously, as researchers, our job is to look ahead and try to address this. So here is a, a famous uh, quotation by Charles Kettering. Uh, it says, if you're doing something the same way you've been doing it for 10 years, the chances are that you're doing it wrong. Okay? So, uh, so we are uh, like it or not, we're, we are going to try to look at 5G, and it's going to be something different from what, what 4G and for what 4G is. Uh, but the nice thing about wireless systems is always we try to keep backward compatibility. So even uh, in, by 2020, we start rolling in 5G devices and the 5G network. No, I haven't told you what it is yet, but whatever it is, if something, is, if that change is coming up, it's going to be uh, uh, kind enough to include the previous generations. Okay, so. What is 5G then? So here is one view, uh, kind of, I, and I like this. That's why I put this here. This is uh, a kind of the way Ericsson uh, envisions what, what they think is 5G should be. So 5G aims fifth generation wireless. The a it aims to provide unlimited access to information and ability uh, to share data anytime by anyone and anything for the benefit of the society. Now, there are two points I want to really bring your attention to. I say unlimited access to information, okay? Just not data. Data may not be just, data is not equal to information, okay? But it's unlimited access to information, but it's going to be enabled by this ability to share data across, uh, we're thinking about people, right? So anytime, anywhere, between anyone. But it's not just people. It says by anyone and anything. So you're going to have devices, machines, inanimate things trying to talk to each other uh, and that's going to bring in a level of ubiquitous intelligence in a sense around us okay and 5g is going to include all of these things okay so that's kind of a kind of a theoretical in a sense kind of a definition uh, of sorts but let's try to visualize if you were transported to maybe 2020 2025 let's say Okay, let's assume there's a five-year lag by the time things, uh, you know, get in place. In 2025, how should your life, wireless world, look like? Okay, and so that is a use case. Here is a use case scenario. 
So you're going to get amazingly fast access, amazingly fast. That means you hit enter, the, every, your, your web, web browser you know, loads everything perfectly, instantaneously, irrespective of the number of images that are there in that website. Um, so that means higher bitrate, right, and lower delays. Then you go, go to uh, an IPL game where there are thousands of other people, you, are not, you still get that same speed. Okay? And you still get service uh, in spite of being in a very crowded environment. Um, and if you're driving to the game, then uh, you're still having that same high speed experience. So that great experience is going to follow you no matter where you go. So that brings in mobility. Right? Uh, and the mobility aspect can be even thought of uh, to include vehicular networks. Right? Maybe your vehicle can be talking as well in addition to you as a person interacting with the web or the cloud. Okay? Um, and so that's a picture of a vehicle interacting with a roadside infrastructure. So what, what we call right now as a V2I network, uh, vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure or ve uh, um, vehicle to curb kind of uh, network. Then uh, super real time and reliable connections. And this is, ex this is kind of exciting because if you have extremely uh, reliable connections, that will help you do some amazing things with respect to interacting with our physical world. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's say uh, you have solar panels uh, that you can, uh, you're going to try to control storage, control, uh, control the energy you're going to consume in your home, maybe remotely uh, control the loads in your, in your home, as well as interact with the grid. Maybe you can sell back energy when the prices are low and, and buy, uh, well, no, sell back energy uh, when the prices are high so that you can get more money and, uh, you know, store when the price uh, and, and uh, you know, you consume when the prices are low. So you can really schedule and do a lot of smart things, provided you have this real-time ability uh, and reliability uh, associated with the network that you are using to interact with these other uh, entities. Uh, another aspect is uh, for disaster recovery, right? For disaster recovery, if you have a reliable network, yeah, even if in the, in the, in the, in the event of something uh, bad, you are still able to maintain your connectivity. Uh, one of the key distinguishing aspects of 5G uh, vision uh, is this ubiquitous things communicating. As I said, what, what we call as machine to machine communication or device to device is what we call in, in kind of the LTE framework, but really it's machine to machine uh, uh, communication, M to M. Okay? Uh, so that's going to change the way, uh, way networks operate. Another view of use case scenario is, uh, is to think of everything, uh, is to think that you are going to get a desktop-like experience even, uh, even when you are on the move. Okay? So the cloud is going to provide you a desktop-like experience. Uh, it's going to be an immersive experience. You could watch high-definition uh, high uh, movies, maybe as you are traveling on the train okay? or as you are driving. Um, Ubiquitous connectivity. I said about machines communicating with each other. That you know, that's really the idea behind the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything. Okay. So every, if all these devices, if this chair, if this projector, everything is communicating with each other, uh, then uh, you're going to get a completely different network here, right? So everything. Uh, it, that's why it's called Internet of Everything. Uh, intuitive remote access. What does that mean? You could do interactive gaming. Right, you could uh, you could remotely access uh, remotely access machines, remotely access services. In this case, it's a you know you could remotely even operate some construction equipment, <laughs> right? So so it's kind of pretty pretty neat neat stuff that one can uh, visualize of what 5G can provide. Now, what does that really mean from a technical standpoint to bring this kind of a world in 2025 to reality? What does that mean? It means a lot of different things. One is we're going to have a significant increase in data volume, and we have to support that data volume. Okay? Our volume uh, is expected to increase 1,000 times okay, compared to uh, what it is right now with 4G systems. Uh, we're going to have 100 times more number of devices. I mean, really 500 billion devices. 
uh, that are going to be connected. You're going to have up to 10 gigabit per second uh, of, of data rate, uh, which is 100 times the 4G data rate. Okay, we're right now 4G, right? It's, well, you're in 3G, but you're gonna go to 4G, but then you're talking about 100 times more uh, data rates. Uh, now, we also want minimum latency. Okay, so right now, in the 4G systems, the latency requirement is about 15 milliseconds. Okay, we want to bring it down to one millisecond in, in 5G. Now, what does that do? As I told you, when you do rem remote gaming, Okay, and if you play games with touch interface, as soon as you touch here and you're, you know, that's going to Im immediately have a response on the other side. So imagine that kind of an immersive, interactive gaming environment. That would be possible only if you have really low latencies. Okay? Now, when you have to increase data rate, so I said data rate is going to be 100 times what it is uh, with 4G. Now, if the energy you're consuming you know, per, uh, per, per, per data transfer stays the same, then you're going to expect 100 times increase in the energy consumed, right? That we can't allow it to happen. Then your batteries are going to die faster, right? So in fact, uh, how many of you have a smartphone here? Like a phone, almost everyone, right? So one of the key annoying parts is having to charge it almost every night, right? And anyone who has a still an old flip phone, does anyone have an old flip phone? No one does? Okay. But you've had it in the past, maybe. Then you know that you charge it once, it probably lasts for two or three days. Right? So, one of the key challenges is as we move to these higher uh, generations and more complicated devices with more services, uh, how can I keep the energy consumption somewhat similar? Because the battery technologies will improve to improve lifetime as well. As well. So uh, you want 10 times more battery life. So that, so that means you want low power devices. And so energy is a critical component of next generation wireless systems. Okay? So I want to reduce the energy for a data link by 100 times in order to kind of deliver the same uh, or even better battery life uh, uh, performance. Okay? So these are the key technical goals that people are thinking about. As I said, again, this is not yet written in stone. Right? The standard is going to, pro people are going to work on the standards in the coming year. But still, this is kind of what people are discussing right now in the community. All right, so the other thing to remember here, it's not just everything is going up. Just because I, I said 100 times the data rate, you know, latency is uh, you know, much smaller, much less, and you know, volume is high. It's not always the maximum that matters. Okay, it does matter. From f it does matter. You do have to have the capacity to support that. But what makes 5G? What's going to make 5G interesting is that the the network has to be extremely flexible, flexible to accommodate different services with different latency requirements, different data rate requirements, uh, and different. Uh, uh, you know, uh, number of links, the number of connected devices, right? So the number of links you might want to support. For example, here, if you look at vehicular telematics, which is, which is one of the services, right? So the key is if your vehicles are talking and you're going to do smart, intelligent transportation systems, latency is a critical, uh, critical uh, uh, metric. So you can see that the latency, you want, it, you want it to be really, really small, okay? On the other hand, uh, the number of links might not be that high. Okay, it's about, you know, it says per kilometer, square kilometer, maybe 100, because there's only a finite number of vehicles you can put in, in some area, right? Um, and the data rate, you don't need that much data rate for, for some of these simple, uh, you know, braking or automatic, uh, um, you know, vehicular manipulation kind of uh, ideas. Uh, so, on the other hand, if you look at interactive high definition television, yeah, it has both high latency requirement. There's probably, every home probably has a TV. And so, and, and you're going to have really high data rate requirements as well. So what I'm trying to tell you is, when you look at 5G network, you have to think of it as a flexible network, okay? Uh, that is able to kind of adapt to the different requirements of the services, okay? So it's not just about more of throughput, more of volume, more of, more number of links. It's a little bit more than that. Does that make sense? Okay. So what is, what, how do we get there then? Okay. So again, I'm, I'm referring to Ericsson's uh, kind of idea. This is a white paper they put out. So 
the vision is the following. The vision is we are going to enter a world where you're going to have an integrated network. Okay? And as a user, you are not even going to be aware of the level of integration that is happening. Now, what does that mean? That means when you take out your phone and you try to play a, a movie in high definition, you will not know through what different pipelines that data is going to be streamed to your phone. Or in other words, all you care about is having a high quality, low latency, perfect picture that you can experience, right? Now, in practice, that information might be coming through multiple radio access technologies. So the same information could be going through, uh, could, the data could be coming through Wi-Fi in combination with the cellular infrastructure uh, or through other, some other technolo new technologies that might be used to pipe high, 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 high data rate uh, services to your phone. So from a user standpoint, it's going to be um, extremely uh, seamless. You will not know. Or it could, you could, it could be that your device is talking to another device that is actually has a high speed link that is streaming data to you as well. So from a user experience standpoint, it's going to be seamless. But from a technology standpoint, what are some key aspects of this integrated network perspective? So you can expect definitely multi-hop communications where every device could serve as a relay, as an assistance to other devices, okay, Ex expanding range, device-to-device uh, -device communication, people could cooperate. My phone could cooperate with a bunch of other phones here to talk to the base station, and we could all benefit from that process. You could have, um, as I said, ultra-reliable communication, given the example of a smart grid there. Uh, massive machine communication, it's all going to be part of this. Okay? And intervehicular, vehicular to road communication, and ultra-dense deployment. So we're going to talk about all of this stuff. But the key message here is, from a network standpoint, it's going to be an integrated network. Okay? And to offer flexible services, the network also has to be flexible. So people are going to be talking about what people have been talking about, something called software-defined networks. Okay? So how to get there? How to get to this, this world in 2025? Okay? Usually, the way we look at uh, evolution is we see kind of where we are and try to figure out, okay, how do I get to this, this new, new step, right? And in a sense, you can do that, but you may also need some revolutionary ideas. Okay? In addition to evolution, you're going to have some revolutionary ideas, some complementary new technologies. And that is exactly true in this case. This is what people are talking about, as I said. We are talking about integration of access technologies into one seamless experience, and that's going to be enabled through some really new revolutionary ideas like massive MIMO. Okay, and we'll talk about that. Ultra dense networks, we'll talk about that. And I say moving networks. Moving networks are like software defined adaptable networks. And we're going to move to higher frequencies as well. Okay? So now, I'm not going to talk about all the dimensions of what, what it uh, takes to get to 5G. Okay? I'm not going to talk about specifically uh, software-defined radios. I'm not going to talk about some of the energy requirements. Okay? These are all very good areas to work on. For uh, The other objective of my talk, again, is to present to you some opportunities for research. All right? This is a ripe area to work in. And uh, in, in our research group at Kansas State, we have uh, worked quite a bit with the uh, device to device machine to machine communication systems as well as uh, uh, you know looking at the energy aspects of uh, of uh, what what we call as heterogeneous systems but today i'm going to focus on getting to this capacity target what was our capacity target what was our capacity target that's a quiz question 10 gigabit per second right so it's 100 times more than where we are with 4g right so how can we increase capacity? And I'm going to focus on three technologies, three enabling technologies that's going to take us there. Okay? So if you look at a simple point-to-point uh, -point network and ask, what is the data rate, bit per second per channel use? What's that? That's given by Shannon's result. You all know this. So if I give you a bandwidth W and you have some signal to noise ratio, the data rate is going to be, or the capacity of this point-to-point -point link is going to be W times log of 1 plus SNR. Now, 
if I want to increase this capacity, in this case, my goal is to get it 100 times more, right? So if I want to do that, I have to attack the different parts here, right? Okay. So there are three ways you can really do this. One is I can increase bandwidth, right? I can increase W, right? The other way is uh, I can spatially reuse uh, frequencies so that I can kind of uh, ensure that my uh, my SNR is not degraded, right? As as more users come in, and I can also improve spectral efficiency through other, you know, fancy uh, modulation techniques, uh, or for for example, multiple antenna MIMO techniques. Okay, so how can we do that? Let's see a quick uh, quick summary here. So first, let's assume instead of just having one base station and all users around, and you, I'm sure you can see some base station here if you look outside. Uh, you see those big, uh, tall uh, towers with a whole bunch of antennas, and they're serving some area, users in some area, right? Now, if we replace those, or, or not necessarily replace, but in addition to those, assume that you make these cells smaller. Okay, you put a whole bunch of base stations, and then what happens is, if I could possibly reuse frequencies that were used here. I could reuse fre frequencies here or here, right? Because now each small base station is smaller, so my footprint is smaller. Okay? I'm not going to interfere because I'm not going to be a powerful base station. I'm not going to interfere with other base stations. So you're talking about something called uh, the idea of small cells instead of large cells. So you have macro cells, then you will have pico cells, and then you can have something called femtocells. Okay, I'll talk about that a little later. But as you get into these kind of heterogeneous small cell networks, heterogeneous small cell networks, then your total capacity now then becomes the capacity all of, of all of these, right? Sum of all the capacities. And uh, each one is, of course, going to be limited by the signal to interference noise ratio. Okay, you could have interference from, because you're reusing frequencies, right? So you could have some interference, even though they, are, they have a smaller footprint. So that's going to, this summation is going to help us get some of the capacity gain. Okay? So we call this extreme densification. We are making our network more dense with a whole bunch of uh, base stations. Does, does that make sense to people? Yeah? You're awake? OK. I hope you didn't have a very good lunch. A very good lunch can put you to sleep. All right, so the other way to increase capacity is to attack the W part I said, right? So the W, which is the bandwidth that someone gives you, uh, if I increase that, obviously I, my capacity goes up. Now, we are pretty much in the less than three gigahertz band for most of our, app, most, most of our current services, right? For cellular, as well as most of our Wi-Fi services. But the idea here is to move to, a, move to, move to much higher frequencies, say 30 to 300 gigahertz which correspond to 1 to uh, 10 millimeter uh, wave, uh, wavelength. So we're talking about millimeter wave spectrum being opened up for cellular access. Okay, now there are some issues with that, we'll talk about that. So that's another way to improve uh, capacity. The third idea is what we, call, what we call as massive MIMO. MIMO stands for multiple input, multiple output systems. It's the idea that you're going to use multiple antennas at your transmitter and multiple antennas at your receiver. So your phones could be, and they probably already have multiple antennas, some of your phones, but the future, the idea is to have multiple, multiple antennas. Your, you know for sure many of your computers, laptops already carry multiple antennas, um, and the base stations, if they have multiple antennas, then you have all these spatial pipes, okay? Uh, so think of it as if I have five antennas here and five antennas there, the channel opens up different spatial pipes between transmitter and receiver. So my total capacity is the sum of the capacity of all these pipes. Then the obvious question is how many pipes can I open up? The more pipes I open up, the bigger my capacity gain is. Well, the, the number of pipes you can open up depends upon the rank of this channel matrix. Okay, so uh, we're, if you start putting a large number of antennas, okay, then uh, of course rank of a matrix depends upon the minimum of uh, of, uh, of 
of your matrix dimensions, right? So you have a better chance of increasing this capacity. Does that make sense? So that's the idea here of improving spectral uh, efficiency. So the key new enabling technologies that you should remember for 5G are what? First is extreme densification. Second, millimeter wave spectrum. Third, massive MIMO. Okay? So if you sleep through the rest of the talk, at least remember these three things. Okay? So that this, these are good topics to work on. Okay? And what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is to kind of tell you what are some key benefits and challenges associated with these three enabling technologies so that you can look into uh, some, uh, some uh, research topics within that domain. So let's start with extreme densification and see what are the, uh, what's the idea here and what are the challenges. So again, the idea here is you're going to move to an environment where you have macro cells, right? These are your big cells. But you may also have some pico cells, smaller base stations. And you may even have what are called as femto cells. The femto cells, you can think of it almost like your Wi-Fi rou router at your home. But the difference is your Wi-Fi operates in unlicensed band, right? So it's limited by interference. In fact, it's limited by what? When you turn on your microwave, I don't know if everyone has microwave, but if you did have a microwave oven close to your Wi-Fi router, there is a good chance your data rate will drop, okay? Because it's operating on almost the same frequencies. But now you're going, you could, oh, or if you have trouble getting wireless connection inside your home, that's another problem too. Sometimes in some areas, that's a problem. Uh, but you can think of a femto cell as almost like an access point, but it's like a little base station that you deploy, but you're going to use the cellular band to actually communicate uh, to that. So you're going to lo you're looking at a at a system where there, there is your number of base stations is going to increase so it's going to become extremely dense and and heterogeneous so what are what are the benefits of course the benefit is as i said you can reuse spectrum so you can uh, hopefully have an increase in capacity okay then you might you might question that statement uh, how how could you question that Suppose I put all these base stations close to each other, okay? They might start interfering with, with each other. So remember, your capacity is related to signal to interference ratio. So if there is more interference, then your capacity actually does not increase, okay? But luckily in 2012, uh, researchers actually proved that for certain power, power loss, path loss models, which is kind of a typical model for how signal decays uh, from the transmitter in a, from say, let's say in a cellular environment, the signal to interference ratio does not actually degrade. Okay? It is actually preserved as network densifies. Okay? That's a pretty neat, neat result and we'll, we'll discuss a little bit more. Uh, so you're, you're trying to, you get something called a densification gain actually. Okay? It's not just preserved, it actually improves in some cases. Okay, so that's the benefit of this. What are the challenges? Well, of course, if you start putting a whole bunch of smaller base stations, what's going to happen? It's, it costs money, right, to put a whole bunch of base stations. So there's cost, there's maintenance issues, and of course, you have to provide backhaul. That means you have to connect these to your, uh, to your cellular backbone, just like your base station has a backhaul to the, in a sense, the cloud or the internet, right? Like that, every base station has to have a backhaul. Um, as I said, we're going to talk about densification gain and user associated. So we're going to talk about this, these challenges. And so let's take one challenge at a time. Okay, let's talk about the densification gain. Okay, what does this mean? So let's say I have a certain density of base stations that are currently here. Let's call that lambda 1. With this density of base stations, let's say I have, I can obtain a rate R1. Okay. Now, if I increase the density to lambda 2, and let's say the new rate is R2, okay, I can define the effective increase as a ratio, rho equals R2 lambda 1 over R1 lambda 2. And obviously, this rho is going to be greater than 0. Right? These are all positive numbers. right? So what happens here? If you have an interference-limited system, so remember I told you, as, as the network uh, densifies, right, so if lambda 2 becomes greater than lambda 1, I said the signal to interference ratio does not 
uh, does not change, right? That was one of the results that was shown in 2012. If signal to interference ratio does not change, that means what? Uh, the, 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 there is no real gain in uh, data rate as well, right? So you would think that uh, you, you probably are not going to get any kind of densification gain uh, when, when this happens, okay? But in practice, in fact, uh, so in practice, that's not the case. SIR actually does not remain constant, okay? In practice, the SIR actually improves a little bit, okay? Why does it improve? Okay. What happens is if I start putting more and more base stations, okay, because the number of users are also somewhat fixed in an area, there's many of these base stations become lightly loaded. That means they don't really have to support many, 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 many people. And in fact, maybe many of them don't even have to support anyone. In that case, the interference actually is going down a little bit. Okay, so that means the signal to interference ratio is actually going up. Okay, so this. So the small cells will become lightly loaded, creating less in interference and the macro cells, uh, than macro cells as density increases. And this actually creates an increase in SINR. So the question to ask is, is this gain enough to compensate the disk with, you know, because you're utilizing these small cells less, that means that's also means that the, 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 that's also does, that also doesn't help, right? Because these are not really working to improve capacity. So is the SINR gain enough to offset this? Uh, lack of use, and the answer is not true in the in the frequencies that we are operating in. Rho can be less than one, which is not desirable, right? You want to have a densification gain that's more than one. But one way people can handle this is what they try to do is they try to mute certain base stations. Okay, they try to turn them off. It's like trying to put them to sleep, or in other words, you're in a, in a sense you're dynamically changing the density of this network. Uh, but by doing that, people have shown that it is possible to keep this densification gain close to one, at least. Okay? Now, for millimeter wave frequency, which is what one of the enabling technologies, right? I haven't spoken to you about that. But if you go to millimeter wave technologies, people have done some studies recently, this last couple of years, to show that actually rho much greater than one is actually possible. Okay? And why is that the case? That's a suspense. I will talk about that when we talk about millimeter wave uh, frequencies. Okay, uh, but you can. I just want you to know why this is kind of uh, this is kind of pretty cool because really look at this. If I make lambda two go to infinity, right? I said I'm increasing the density, right? I start with lambda. If I make lambda two go to infinity, here what happens to rho? Rho goes to zero. So really, that suggests that something is not right. So it's going exactly the opposite of what we want. Okay? But in practice, that's not really uh, what, what we want to get. So you know, there are ways to deal with that. So you can't just blindly uh, take it there. Okay? So there, is, there are a lot of open problems in understanding this densification game. Okay? So you can, talk, you can consider different scenarios, uh, uh, deployment scenarios and network models and try to quantify these densification and optimizing this densification game for heterogeneous networks. Another key challenge is now you are, your phone has an ability to associate with a base station, macro base station. It can associate to a femto base station. It can associate to a micro base or pico base station. Or it can associate to your wireless access point, right? Or and it can do both, right? So that means you have multiple radio access technologies, and your device, which has probably some new millimeter wave capabilities which probably has backward compatible. Remember, it has to have 3G, 4G, as well as Wi-Fi and device to device. And so the key question is, when, when it's, which standard should it use? Okay, which base station should it talk to and associate? Remember, every time you make a call, you are, in a sense, married to one base station in the, in the traditional model. So which one should I, should, I, should I use in this integrated network vision of 5G? That is a key challenge, okay? so. People have tried to work on this in the last few years. Again, these are all very recent results. Last year and, uh, and this year, people are continuing work. So optimal association of users to base station is a combinatorial optimization problem. Because obviously, SINR from every user to every possible base station uh, is one, one parameter. The instantaneous load, 
how loaded is that base station. Maybe your SINR to the macro base station is pretty high. But if the macro base station is extremely loaded, that's not good, right? So you know, there are ways to handle this uh, through kind of an optimization, uh, combinatorial optimization approach. So as, as researchers, I want to emphasize building core skills. I was talking to some of you guys. If you want to work in wireless communication area, any communication area, you should have very strong background in linear algebra. You should have very strong background in probability theory. Okay? You should have very strong background in uh, optimization theory. Without these three, it is very difficult to do any useful research in communication. Of course, software, I'm assuming you can all do some software. But I'm just saying, these are some fundamental skills that you should develop right now. Okay? So here is an optimization kind of problem. And uh, so some interesting results have shown that uh, if you bias yourself to always connect to the small cells instead of the macro cells, you can actually see a 50%, a 500% increase in edge rate. What is edge rate? In any cellular system, the biggest challenge is to offer a high data rate service to a person who's at the periphery of your cellular cell. Okay, if they're, they're on the periphery, that's the biggest challenge to cover them. So by doing these kind of uh, biasing towards smaller cells, you can really improve those edge rates. Okay? Uh, later, I'm going to talk about millimeter waves. And association with millimeter waves are going to be even a bigger challenge. Okay? I will give you a glimpse right now. One of the things with millimeter waves is, uh, unlike microwaves, millimeter waves uh, don't bend, bend around objects. So, or in other words, they get blocked. Okay? That means in order for me to use millimeter wave to communicate, I have to almost have a line of sight. Okay? If that's the case, then I could be uh, close to a, 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 a base station, they say, with the, with the millimeter wave capabilities. But if there is an obstruction in between, I should not be associating with that base station. Even though in the traditional approach, you would think that, hey, that's the closest one. Must, you might even have, you might think that will have a high SINR, but say something comes in between, right? So that makes it even more complicated, OK? Then, um, so, so people have done some work in this kind of user association. And based on user association, doing resource allocation and load, load balancing. Because as I said, your, your information could be going through a bunch of different base stations. But you might be simultaneously connected to your Wi-Fi access point and, other, and a base station. And your video might be coming through two different pipelines to you. Okay. So how do you allocate resources amongst the two in these kind of heterogeneous networks? So people have worked on this. But definitely, there is, more ne there is need for more modeling, analysis, and optimizing these kind of association problems for complex scenarios. Okay. It, then it becomes a complete headache if people start moving around. Right? I said associating a user to different base stations is a problem. Imagine if they are moving around. So to support mobility, it becomes an even bigger challenge. right? Um, and this is the key aspect that differentiates cellular systems from Wi-Fi. right? Within a Wi-Fi environment, you're not really mobile. You're mobile in a very small area. But if you're going on a, on a, on a bus or a train, you know, that's not something that a Wi-Fi system can really keep up with. So, uh, so the vision, so, so how, do you, how do you deal with this channel? So here is the vision for 5G. Okay? And it's a drastic change from existing way, ways of looking at cellular systems. In, in 5G, the idea of a traditional cell might actually vanish in the, in, the, in the sense that, as a user, think of me as the center of a virtual cell. Okay? I am at the middle of a virtual cell. That means if there are two or three base stations, as I move, I might have different base stations within my, my cell. Okay, and I could use any of those. So that's the perspective that people are planning to take. So there's a user-centric virtual cell, and I could simultaneously associate with multiple base stations for that. Okay? Now, I told you in millimeter wave systems, you have this blocking because of objects. So imagine if you're moving, that's a problem, right? How do you hand off? You remember, you know what a handoff is, right? So when you're moving, typically your call gets handed off from one base station to another base station. Okay? So when you're having these kind of uh, uh, obstructed environments, 
how do you hand off to let's say this other millimeter wave uh, access point but let's say what if it's obstructed because you have moved you think that's the next one but maybe that's not the next one okay so there's significant challenges there so one possible solution that people are talking about is to say that if I am going at a, at a high speed, maybe I will not use, uh, say, millimeter wave frequencies uh, for, uh, for doing data trans transmission. Rather, use still microwave frequencies so that at least I don't have this issue of blocking. And I don't, the, the user association problem, of course, it is still a challenge because you have multiple base stations. Okay, that you still have to do. You still have a user-centric cell, but at least you don't have to deal with the, uh, with, the, with the handoff management with millimeter wave systems. So this is a really exciting problem domain. Again, a lot of modeling, analysis, and optimization of strategies to provide mobility support is important. Okay? So that brings us to the end of the densification idea. So let's, let me summarize. So to increase capacity, we're putting more cells in an area. Putting more cells implies what? Well, you get the benefit of frequency reuse. You hopefully you get some densification gain. But you may, not, you may not always get it unless you're smart about how you're going to operate your, or your different cells. Okay? And you may get, get it when you go to, say, millimeter wave spectrum. Second is what? Extreme densification means you have a lot of base stations you could possibly associate with. So you've got to find a smart way of doing that. Third, you have to have, find a smart way of managing mobility within this dense, uh, dense network. Is that OK? So that, let's move on to the second enabling technology, which is just use this higher bandwidth. right? The large bandwidth in the 30 to 300 gigahertz spectrum. It's idle. Okay, and uh, large bandwidth implies more capacity because Shannon capacity is W log one plus SNR. Okay, so why is this bandwidth kind of exciting for us to use? Well, it's exciting because our beachfront spectrum—that's what we call it. What we are using right now is called the beachfront spectrum. That's up to three gigahertz is what we've been using for everything. Uh, that's pretty much uh, packed. Okay. We need more for 5G, especially for the technical goals that I put, right? 1,000 times more data volume, 100 times more data rate, low latency, all that stuff. Um, so, so having more bandwidth makes sense. And it's open, so you might as well use it, right? OK, so as I said, there are some challenges. Understanding the propagation issues at this extremely high frequencies is important, OK? And we'll talk about some of the propagation issues. Now, if you talk to any RF engineer and, and, and say, hey, I'm going to use a 60 gigahertz, 100 gigahertz signal, they're going to laugh. Okay? Uh, partly because it's just the current state of equipment and the affordab affordability of those bands is extremely limited. Okay? But things are changing. And it's been, uh, there are some developments that have happened within the Wi Fi regime. Okay? Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, the Y gig standard? Y gig, okay? It's uh, right now we have 802.11. What what routers do you have typically? 802.11. B is the old one. You are a G, okay? Okay, N is there, right? So after that you have 802.11 AC, which is even higher, and then the standard there is a standard called 802.11 AD, okay? Which is offering gigabit per second kind of data rates, which is like having your computer wired, right? Your, your Ethernet, you have a gigabit Ethernet now. This is going now going to match that. Now, how are they going to do that? They are talking about using the 60 gigahertz spectrum. Okay, again, you're in the millimeter wave web band. And the standard is already in place. Products are probably already coming out this year. And so what that means is maybe these uh, equipment costs may not be that big of a deal. Okay, uh, as as there is interest and development, when, when when a standard is developed, industry finds a way to uh, come up with a product that that is feasible, more both economically, uh, of course, and meets the technical uh, the requirements. Uh, there are also fixed wireless systems and standards, 
uh, that operate in this in this band. You understand what fixed wireless is? It's basically trying to think of think of it as I don't know. Are you familiar with LMDS and MMDS kind of standards? It's kind of uh, uh, it's a point-to-point -point high speed uh, pipe, think of it that way, where uh, everything is fixed, you're not, you're not mobile, okay? Uh, where would you use it? Maybe you want to have a high speed link to your office in the 10th floor of a building, and you just put a pipeline, a wireless pipeline to your office, okay? Uh, so, so there is optimism as far as being able to uh, realize these millimeter wave, uh, millimeter wave uh, devices and products. But as I told you, there are challenges on in pro related to propagation issues. Okay, what are some, what are the key challenges? Okay, so this is, uh, this is the first challenge, path loss, okay? What's going to happen is, so you all know this, as frequency increases, what happens to wavelength? Okay, what happens to antennas? The antennas shrink. Right, Sh antennas will shrink, and the effective aperture also shrinks. Right, it's only lambda squared over four pi. Now, what happens to free space path loss? As frequency increases, you have a FC squared, so the path loss increases with the square of the frequency. So, if you're going to go to gigahertz, that means you're going to have significant path loss, up to 20 dB of path loss, irrespective of distance. I'm not even talking, so if I'm here, and you're there, and if I'm here and in the next room, it doesn't matter. Because of the frequency I'm using, there's a, a 20 dB, a thir uh, 20 dB of loss, okay, at, at uh, from 3 to 30 gigahertz. So that's, that's not very encouraging, right? Okay, so now, there is a way around it. If you keep the aperture of one, either the transmitter or the receive antenna, if you keep the aperture the same as the frequency changes, you know that the aperture, what happens to aperture? It shrinks, right? As frequency increases. But if you somehow manage to keep it the same at one side, not you don't even need to do it on both sides, then you can show that the path loss is actually unchanged. Okay? In fact, in, uh, it, can, it can even get smaller uh, with, with FC squared. Okay? That's kind of neat, right? So how do I make the aperture, how, how can I keep the aperture same even though my lambda is getting smaller? One way to do that is by using an array of antennas. Uh, and, and what you can do is maybe individually the antenna aperture is small, but together you can create a larger aperture, okay, larger uh, effective area for this antenna. Okay? So when that happens, now you, you're going to put multiple antennas together then the challenge is how do I co-phase these antennas, especially when the channel is, is changing very quickly. So you have Doppler and other things. So, and you know, small changes, small slight movements of your, of you can change the, uh, uh, change the whole co-phasing uh, co needs, right? Because you have some small scale angular variation uh, that can challenge your, uh, uh, your handling of the transmissions. So that's, that's one, one key challenge. Every challenge is an opportunity. Okay. Another challenge, as I told you, is the blocking at this, at this spectrum. Okay. So microwaves bend around buildings okay. and bend around edges. And that's called di diffraction. Right? Uh, and so you've probably already studied knife edge diffraction models to, to kind of quantify wireless uh, path loss. Uh, but that's a very good thing. Right? Uh, un unfortunately, at these millimeter wave uh, signals, they don't actually do that. They actually are blocked. They, they get blocked. Okay? So reduced diffraction leads to blocking. And that's, that gives you another 15 to 40 dB per decade of uh, frequency due to a loss due to blocking. So that means the link becomes quickly unusable if you have something in the middle. So if I'm a, I have a transmitter here. And you are, your receiver is right there, and someone brings, uh, I know, a big board right here. Okay, your microwave frequency will go around, bend around, and reach you. Your millimeter wave frequency is going to get blocked right there. Okay, that's not good. So, how do we, how do we deal with this? The first way, first thing to do is understand how this works. So, model the channel. So, there's a lot of efforts recently. Uh, especially at uh, NYU, New York University, on, on developing new channel models to capture the effects uh, at this, uh, these frequencies. 
Another challenge relates to atmospheric and rain absorption. So at the millimeter wave band, you have almost 15 dB per kilometer of oxygen absorption within the 60 gigahertz band. So that's significant, right? But here's the nice thing. This is actually good for us. Can someone tell me why it is good for us? Why is this kind of an absorption good for us? So this is atmospheric and rain absorption. That means you're talking about external, right? So it may reduce interference. That's right. It reduces interference because the signal is going to die down pretty quickly, right? So if I have a base station that is using this millimeter wave frequency to talk to devices that are also equipped with that capability, then, and they are in outside, you know, there's the footprint is going to be pretty localized, right? And remember, that's, that kind of feeds into our densification idea of putting more base stations, right? And so there'll be less interference if, you, if they use this, is this band, okay? Now, to, obviously, to make this happen, because you have, uh, uh, I said, millimeter waves, you need a larger aperture, so I have to use an, use an array of antennas. And now I'm talking about, um, so these arrays are, have to almost point, in a sense, at a particular target, because if there is any obstruction, it's not going to bend, it's going to get blocked. So you need some kind of a line of sight. So you need large antenna arrays that can be steered, and you can still operate coherently to, to decode. Okay? So this is a completely foreign concept to cellular systems. None of the antenna, none of the microwave antennas really have that kind of a pointed beam that they use. They in fact have a larger footprint because you can cover a lot more people with reasonable uh, accuracy. So in, at millimeter wave bands, you have to think of your signaling as almost like flashlights. Okay, if I want to talk to you in this frequency, I'm going to shine a flashlight on you and then I'm going to talk to you. That's the, that's the best, that's the, that's the way you have to make these systems work. Okay, if I do that, which is very new, right? What are some of the, some of the like, unique things? The first thing is the interference, number one, is going to be very limited, okay, right? I have no interference from any of you guys. I'm just pointing my light, my, 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 my flashlight at you. But as and when you have someone either you know, come close or walk by, because I have a flashlight you, I have a flashlight at you, and maybe when you get closer, f temporarily if there is movement, you could have some interference and then you go, go away, right? So interference will take on like an on-off kind of behavior, okay? So we need to understand that's a very new behavior for a cellular system, okay? Um, if I'm not perfectly aligned to you, I might still suffer. So there is some issues with not being perfectly aligned, and that's where the coherency is a, is a problem. Because I'm having these flashlights, the system as such is not interference limited. Interference is not a problem in millimeter wave systems. So it's more noise limited, which is different from any previous cellular systems like 4G. Okay? Now again, as I said, with millimeter wave systems, now what, how do you define a cell then? What is the definition of a cell? So in 3G and 4G, for us, we say we have a base station. It has some antennas and whatever uh, coverage it, it can get along this, uh, in a sense, azimuth angle. Right? That kind of tells me what that cell coverage is going to be. Right? Now in this case, I'm doing flashlights. Right? And I may have block blocks, right? So even though I'm doing flashlight, let's say I'm right next to a wall right here. Can I have any coverage in the back? No. So what, how do I define my cell? How do I draw a cell? Right? So that, this is a different way to look at the world now. Okay? So if that's the case, the, the other problem is association as well, right? So initially, if I want, if you want, how, how does your phone work? As soon as you turn your phone on, it will try to talk to the nearest base station, okay? And get a ID and say, register itself before even you start. That's called the control access, control plane, okay? Before even you start communicating, there is this exchange of information over the control plane. Now, if you, uh, if you have a millimeter wave system and I wake up, I turn my phone on, I have no idea where, where the base station is. In fact, I have to point exactly at you, right? If I'm, that's the only way I can communicate. I can't randomly, randomly send a signal out like a millimeter, like a microwave system. 
So that's a challenge. And of course, it's also a challenge for handoffs, as I said, because I have to exactly point at the right, in the right direction. My flashlight has to follow exactly where I want to uh, point. Uh, so these are really big challenges. Okay? So how are people trying to deal with this? So the initial thought is the following. What people are saying is, let's not try to use this millimeter wave spectrum for the control signals. Let's just use the traditional, how your 4G phones or your 3G phones, how they will do. So they, let's keep the authentication, the initial exchange of information over microwave frequencies. And then once you establish that, have used the millimeter wave for purely pushing data through you. Why? That's where the power comes, right? Millimeter wave, you have so much bandwidth. You're at 60 gigahertz. You can get this capacity. So I will use it to pump data to you for your high speed, high definition movies. But I will not use it for control signal. Okay? So that's kind of an interesting, interesting phenomenon. Uh, there are, of course, hardware issues as well at millimeter wave, as I said. Uh, again, I'm not an expert in this, so I can't uh, talk, talk anything intelligent about it. But I can tell you the big picture, uh, a, a to D conversions and D to A con converters are really a big challenge when you have wide bandwidth uh, signals. Okay? And so these have become extremely expensive. They're power hungry. Um, and when you're talking about these large number of antennas, remember we need an antenna array to increase aperture. Uh, you know, building a digital beam former for each antenna is, is kind of hard. Um, you know, driving through common A to D and D to A was a challenge. Uh, now, the other thing is, of course, channel estimation and beam forming techniques. So here is a good, again, research area. Um, because you have a large number of antennas, right? It's an array. Maybe there is correlation among those channels, so that means uh, you can use to, for channel estimation, you can use some ideas from compressive sensing uh, to actually estimate channel exploiting the sparsity in the system. Okay, so the last. Okay, so before I go to the last one, re recollect the second enabling technology. What is it? Millimeter wave spectrum, right? What are the key aspects here? Large bandwidth gives me large capacity. What are the problems? Path loss. Which has, how, how do we deal with that? By using large antenna array, arrays to increase aperture. What's the other problem? Blocking. Blocking. And that can complicate a whole bunch of other things. right? Uh, so we have to find ways to deal with that. OK, so the third idea deals with using multi, multi, multiple antennas at the transmitter and multiple antennas at your, in, your, in, in your receiver so that you can get benefits from what are called as MIMO techniques. Okay? Uh, so as I said, uh, this MIMO concept is really not new. The idea of MIMO was actually uh, you know, started in the 90s. And by middle of 2000, it was actually implemented in many Wi-Fi products. And as, as it's part of the 3G and 4G standards. Okay? Uh, so what does MIMO give us? MIMO gives us something called multiplexing gain and diversity gain. So this is the idea that you can take this channel and create parallel data pipes and push more data through it. Uh, and that's your multiplexing gain. Or you can take your, uh, take your channel and coherently combine the multiple signals you receive and get some diversity benefit out of it. Okay? So the, the key aspect of this gain depends upon this channel being independent so that that gives you all these if it's a completely independent channel between every transmit antenna and every receive antenna, every channel is, let's say, is independent. That's your best case scenario. Okay, that gives you that defines the dimensions of your signaling. Okay, and uh, that while that is good, it may not always be possible to have a perfectly uncorrelated independent channel. Okay, uh, but anyway, so people started working on first what is called a single user MIMO. What does that mean? Uh, the spatial dimensions are limited by the number of antennas on a single user. So let's say you have a base station and you have one user. Of course, you're limited by the number of antennas on one of these devices. So let's, it's a only one user. Okay? But in reality, uh, you could also talk about multi-user MIMO, which is the idea that 
maybe the base station is talking to you, but really not only talking to you, but it's talking to a whole bunch of you guys, right? So that means all your devices, you can treat all those antennas together as a multi-antenna system, right? So that creates a multi-user MIMO system. A slight deviation of this is what is called as cooperative multi-point system, comp system. Here the idea is multiple base stations cooperate with each other and act as a MIMO transmitter in a sense. Okay? So in that, in that case, you can use that to actually change interference from multiple base stations into a favorable signal almost. Okay? So you can morph this. So a lot of cool stuff can be done. And these are ideas that are part of existing standards. Okay? And it's part of LTE and there's a lot of papers on these things. Now, this is just MIMO. I'm not talking about large MIMO, or massive MIMO. This is just MIMO stuff. What is massive MIMO? So massive MIMO was first introduced by uh, Marzetta in, in, his, uh, in a presentation in 2007 and followed by a paper. And the idea is to have large number of antennas, not just you know, two or three antennas, large number of antennas, and, that, and benefit from the MIMO, uh, uh, MIMO, MIMO uh, advantages, even without the need for densification. Okay? Why do we do this? Remember, because you have channel variations, what, what we call a small scale fading, right? So when you use large number of uh, antennas, those small scale randomness will, will kind of abate, will, will kind of die down as you start observing this channel multiple times, right? Because these are large, uh, you have a large number of channels, and as the number of channel observations grow, the small scale f fluctuations can be kind of uh, attenuated. And because of these large antennas, massive MIMO antennas, you could, in a sense, even do these kind of specific beam forming ideas, right? So larger the aperture, that means I can finer the finer my beam, right? So by by you can almost make these orthogonal. These channels could be orthogonal between different transmitters and receivers, and that can help you. It's like it's like almost like I'm 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 doing beams to everyone individually. And that orthogonalization of those channels, so my, your channel is orthogonal to this channel, to this channel, and that orthogonalization yields really much simpler receivers. Okay? And that's kind of neat. Okay? But there are different challenges with this idea as well. So here is a picture of a 256 antenna system. Okay? Um, and, and your phone could have a 16 antenna system as well at the back. So you're talking about even, so your 5G devices could have multiple antennas. And if you noticed here, this is not just a linear array. Actually, currently, if you see some of the towers, uh, I don't know about towers here, but I'm pretty sure, you, you will see some towers with a linear array of antennas. Okay? At least uh, in the US, you see that quite often. Um, but the way I've drawn this, this picture is drawn, you can see it's a two-dimensional planar array. Okay? So uh, this, this is called full-dimensional MIMO. Okay? So we, there, we, can, we can talk about that here in a second. So let's talk about some of the challenges in massive MIMO. So within the, the idea of MIMO is depends upon your ability to estimate the channels between all transmit antennas and receive antennas. And you have a whole bunch now, right? With massive MIMO, that means you have a whole bunch of channels. Okay, for channel estimation, what do we do? We try to send some known signal, and we call that a pilot signal. And if I send a known signal at the transmitter and I receive it, the only thing I need to estimate is the channel. I can do that, right? Now, in this case, I'm going to use some pilots for estimating a whole bunch of channels. And then I have to reuse that pilots. Uh, I can, within the same cell, I have to use orthogonal pilots. But in the next cell, I'm going to use so, the same, same pilots because I can't use, keep using different pilots uh, that, because I'm going to be spending some, some of my resources on pilots, right? So I don't want that much overhead. So when I reuse across cells, then I could have these pilot signals interfering with each other. That means my ability to estimate the channel is going to go down. So this is called as pilot contamination. You don't want that. And this is especially severe for a large number of antennas. So there are results that show that pilot contamination does not go to zero as interference, as, as the number of antennas grow. Okay, so what do we do then? So people in the last year or so, and even right now, this is an active field of research, are talking about 
Caref how do we design these pilot structures? How do we exploit spatial correlations and share pilot signals among antennas uh, instead of totally using orthogonal pilots, you know, maybe we do something else. Um, so these are some problems that we can work on. There are architectural challenges. As I told you, the base station will look different. These are some hardware issues because you have a massive MIMO system, large number of antennas. Do I drive each antenna with its own uh, power amplifier? Or do I use a few high power amplifiers uh, for a whole bunch of antennas together? So these are questions and scalability and cost considerations. I spoke about the idea of using a 2D antenna, full dimensional MIMO. You know, so if you use 2D, so with the current linear array, I pretty, most of the current base stations are primarily concerned about uh, azimuth, which is this around, around you. When you use 2D arrays, you have actually, you can also control the elevation of your beams and the azimuth. And that brings up new degrees of freedom, but also kind of new channel models or modeling efforts are needed to quantify exactly the effect when you have that, that kind of a uh, transmission. So uh, people are working on these kind of channel models. Uh, and because you're talking about large number of antennas in a small area, many of these channels will be correlated. Antennas might couple. So there's coupling effects that have to be uh, cons considered as well. Of course, remember, all three enabling technologies are not operating in isolation. They have to operate together, right? So small cells uh, without massive MIMO or with massive MIMO, you know, how does that, that impact? So people can look at the, com the effect of both. Uh, integration with millimeter wave is a natural one. Why is it a natural one? Because what did I say? With millimeter waves, the antenna size shrinks, right? So I should be able to put a whole bunch of antennas together and it will be perfect. Okay, so I can see people uh, kind of uh, dozing off. So uh, hopefully I'll, uh, uh, you're awake for the last slide, okay? Okay, please wake up right now. Yeah. So what we spoke about was our vision of 5G. It is not set in stone, okay? But I wanted to let you know what is coming up. What will 5G be? What are some key technical goals? The thing I want you to remember is 1,000-fold increase in data volume, 100-fold increase in data rate, uh, one millisecond latency, machine-to-machine -machine communication, billions of devices. Right? That, this is, that's the key uh, idea behind what, what 5G's technical requirements are. But really, how are we going to view the world? A seamless experience where you have integrated networks, right? Your Wi-Fi, it, it doesn't matter. You are not going to know how your data is coming through, but it's going to come through, through an integration of all of these networks. Um, then we spoke about the three main enabling new technologies. And that's why I focused on these three, because these are not right now part of, say, your LTE system. The new technologies that are going to enable these huge capacity gains are what? Number one, extreme densification. Number two, millimeter wave spectrum. Number three, massive MIMO. Okay? So with these three, that we are, we can achieve some of those technical technical goals, but we can't achieve them easily. There are key technical challenges still to be solved. Okay? So I would encourage you to look into some of these issues as you're starting your, uh, your, your research programs, because every challenge, in a sense, is an opportunity. Okay? So with that, I will stop, and uh, I'm open for questions or thoughts or comments. It's very well understood and people know how to do that, and they've been doing it for many years now. So uh, there might be slight variations of OFDMA. So I shouldn't say just OFDM. So uh, there are different uh, variations that people are talking about uh, within the context of modulation. But it's expected to be driven by OFDM. Questions or comments? OK, uh, any other questions? Is, uh, that's just a general term, right? What do you mean by smart antenna, right? Uh, that's right. So, beam forming by nature yes. is what I was. By that's what. So when when, when we talk about multi antenna systems, uh, those things that's that's kind of impl implied by that. Okay, the, they should give you capacity gains. They should give you diversity gains. Diversity gains come from being able to 
smartly beam form and and you know ignore you know kind of mitigate interference and things like that yes definitely